What's the best option for replacing an aging Range Rover that's costing you more than 10 grand a year just to keep it on the road? A guaranteed buyback on a Land Cruiser VX? Or is there a better option? That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. This question comes from Alan. Very industrious too. A video question and quite well shot. Well done there. Let me know if you like the video question format. We might even make it a thing in future. I have a... Um L322 Range Rover 2002 model. Uh, it's got the infamous 4.4 petrol uh, BMW V8 engine in it. The uh, the old timing chain slip model. Uh, I have had the engine rebuilt at great expense after uh, blowing the engine one afternoon. Um, I paid about $17,000 for it four years ago. It has had everything done to it. It has cost me more than $10,000 a year just to keep it on the road. Um, I'm getting to the stage where I'm thinking it's, you know, it might be great now, it's had everything redone to it, but I, I've got um, three small kids, a small business, a massive Great Dane, I just, um, I need uh, reliability, I need one less stress in my life and the car's got to go. So I'm calling to ask you about the new Range Rover, uh, the new Land Cruiser. VDJ 200R. I wish I could have a new Range Rover, but it's not going to happen. Uh, partly because of resale value, and this is why I'm thinking about the Land Cruiser. Um, there's a, a, a much better dealer support network. Um, they are more reliable, it goes without saying. It's a Toyota. Um, and the only reason I'm thinking about it, because it's, you know, it's a lot of money for a car that doesn't overly excite me, um, but guaranteed buyback, um, you know, at 70,000 kilometres after three years, um, or $70,000, I should say, um, at an agreed um, amount of kilometres. Uh, a new VX Land Cruiser, you're looking at, you know, $250, $300 a week. Um, that'd be good for the cash flow for the business. Um, you know, paying, you're only paying off the, the agreed depreciation, you're not paying off the whole amount of the vehicle. Um, and it's resale value. So the resale value is stronger than the Prado. That's why I'm thinking about the Land Cruiser, besides the fact it's also larger. So is, is there something I'm missing? Why is half my town flooded with Land Cruisers and every other town, um, everyone has one? Um, is Toyota Finance too good to be true? Is it gonna come back and bite me? And will the secondhand market be flooded with all of these cars when everyone starts flipping them over and they're suddenly not worth as much? Um, a mate of mine just got an XC90. It's a magnificent car, beautiful, but and it, it, the finance is next to nothing. Uh, he got an extra year's warranty for $1,000, um, but I know from your videos that warranties uh, shouldn't matter. Um, but the depreciation on that XC90 will be horrific compared to the Land Cruiser. Also, dealer network and reliability. So, should I just sell my Range Rover and go and buy a brand new Land Cruiser, um, even though it seems so much money, but not much money at all. That's my question to you. Thanks, John. Okay, so there's quite a bit to unpack here. First up, owning a 17-year-old Range Rover makes me wonder, Alan, if you were actually a serial killer in a previous life. This is like the karmic retribution. I mean, mate, God is a kid with an ant farm, okay? High off his tits on crack. That's kind of obvious. And this is exactly the kind of thing he does to good people. For <laughs> shits and giggles. It's the only thing that makes the world make sense. That or just random chance. So yeah, getting rid of the O2 rangey, very good idea. You're up against the second law of thermodynamics there, mate, with that shit heap, and you cannot win. No amount of cash will unfuck a vehicle of that nature. And as for what to replace it with, not a Volvo, 
Also a great idea, mate. But selecting a vehicle on the basis of a guaranteed buyback is a little bit nuts. I went through this exercise anyway, though, on Toyota's website here in Chittsville, based on a new Land Cruiser VX diesel at 6% interest over three years with Toyota Access. That's their bullshit bend over and here's your guaranteed future value offering online. And the result I got was 391 bucks a week, not 250 to 300. And that's almost 1700 bucks per month. And based on my lowball estimate of 15,000 kilometres a year, the best they would offer me online as a buyback is 65 grand, not 70. So basically, you're financing about 40,000 bucks in depreciation over three years, which is about 20 grand a year, including interest. That's roughly double what the shitbox Jurassic Range Rover is costing you currently. But it's not like you're getting nothing for nothing. You are getting a brand new car and it should be, will be, far more reliable and a lot more contemporary in terms of safety and features. Even though you still won't get Apple CarPlay or Android Auto because Toyota remains mentally retarded on that. And Toyota's reliability is good. I mean, it's not as good as they claim, but it's still pretty good, especially in the context of your current transportation. But you don't need a Land Cruiser for three kids and a dog, mate. You don't, not even in the country. You need a Land Cruiser for 3.5 tonne trailer towing and or hardcore desert crossing, wilderness stumping into submission adventuring, in a blue singlet sleeping like an Aussie Chuck Norris, in a swag full of death adders. <laughs> Hashtag Australia. Basically, though, I think guaranteed buyback is an especially good deal for Toyota. You go back to the dealership in three years, right? And they take the car off your hands. And then what do you do? You buy another Toyota without shopping around. That's the underlying objective here. So quite good for them, but not an especially good deal for you because you'd trade in that VX anywhere in decent condition with 45,000 Ks on the clock in three years for 65 grand. No problem. It's a done deal. The guarantee just means that they are guaranteed to get the finance and your future new vehicle business. And Land Cruiser is complete overkill for the things you've told me you do. As an example, try comparing a Hyundai Santa Fe Highlander, right? It is fully loaded with every conceivable feature. It's well supported, reliable, quite nice to drive from the number three automotive brand in this country. And it is the best vehicle they make. Okay, it's not a hardcore off-roader or a real heavy tow platform, but it is the best mainstream seven-seat SUV currently available and much more refined than a Land Cruiser for normal domestic duties both around town and out on the highway. <laughs> Suck it up, Toyota fanboys. That's just how it is. Santa Fe Highlander is about 65000 bucks drive away. That's the full freight. And you would get a discount, of course. But let's just say you walk in and pay the sixty-five grand Cross the counter, no negotiating. You buy it under a chattel mortgage through the business. So you get the GST back in the first bass, okay? That's effectively a refund of about six grand. You'd sell it for 40 grand in a private sale or 35 as a trade-in in three years' time. I just checked that, actually. That's what the previous generation 2016 models are selling for today. So let's say 35 grand after three years. That's a fairly conservative estimate. Seven-seat SUVs. Very popular in the used market. Retained value, okay, depreciation, whatever you call it. It's a function of supply and demand. And demand for that kind of vehicle is high. A three-year-old Santa Fe will still be the current shape in 2022, and it will have two years factory warranty remaining on the clock. Families on a budget are going to see that as an attractive proposition. Independent finance, okay? You're essentially looking at financing 30 grand over three years at 6%, say. In other words, 65,000 bucks over three years with effectively a $35,000 balloon. 
that's about 1100 bucks a month or 250 a week, which is substantially less than the almost 400 bucks a week that the Land Cruiser VX is going to cost you, according to Toyota's website. And I strongly advise you to investigate independent finance because the more transactions you conduct under the one roof at that dealership, the more leverage you are giving them. In other words, the more avenues they will have for surreptitiously pumping up the price and profiteering from you. And I'm just using Santa Fe here as an example because it's currently my pick for the seven seat non-off-roading set. But you could do exactly the same thing with a $65,000 Kia Sorento or a Mazda CX-9 or CX-8. There's just better value than a Land Cruiser for you, which even Alan admits not being especially exciting as driving propositions go. So Alan lives in regional New South Wales. So by definition, the street outside is full of Toyota 4x4s. And he can certainly buy the VX if he wants to. I just don't happen to think it's especially on target for Alan and his driving requirements or the budget, at least from a value perspective. Nor do I think the guaranteed buyback is an especially good deal for anyone. You will certainly get a massive upgrade over an old and busted, possessed by Satan Range Rover with much better value if you buy a Santa Fe, a Sorento, CX-9, CX-8, whatever. At least that's how this plays out for me. Now, if you would like to submit a video question, ask me anything within friggin' reason, just upload the video to Dropbox or Hightail or some facility like that online in the cloud and send the download link to info at autoexpert.com.au. Hit me up on the website for that. So it could be kind of interesting at the very least, but let's try to keep it classy, okay? And now, this. I just spat my dinner on the keyboard on the polishing my carrot comment. Smiley face. So thanks for that. You know how hard it is to get chewed up food out of between the keys? Well, thank you sincerely for letting me know because nothing, absolutely nothing says sincerely amused like masticating all over the keyboard. It never fails to amaze me just how epistemically ambiguous the issue of carrot polishing is because, you know, if one is enthusiastically polishing one's own carrot, in the moment it does seem quite the serious undertaking, doesn't it? And yet, when considering carrot polishing more broadly in the context of modern society, it can at times be quite amusing. There's no underlying consistency, that's for sure. More proof, perhaps, that the big fella upstairs is nothing more than a maladjusted teenager on crack. The fact that you sometimes wear a Raiders hat and then in the next video don a Broncos hat is problematic. I understand that not being a retarded stand native, you might not realise the heresy you're committing when you do that. But you have now been advised and no longer have an excuse. Up front, let me say I absolutely understand the concept of tribalism in sport. And I get that there is huge tribal significance wrapped up in the logos on my hats in your fine country, Retardistan. In fact, Retardistan and Shkaya, yes, two of the finest tribal sport-loving countries on earth. So there's that, two of the finest countries on earth, provided we don't let our leaders continue to get carried away with, you know, this and that. So, in relation to the hats, I just really like the graphics, and I'm sad to admit in front of you Retardistanis that Sometimes I don't even get what code of sport the teams that underpin the graphics that I wear beneath my chrome dome actually represent. I wouldn't understand, therefore, the granular detail of that tribal conflict if it jumped up one day and polished my carrot. 
This whole fishing for this like story arc is mind fuckery at its best. Mainly because I can't figure out if this obvious reverse psychology reacquisition of dislikes is accidental or deliberate. On one level, of course, I am being completely straight with you because it would be impossibly excellent, not to mention healthy in my view, were this fine channel to achieve its stated aim of a minimum 25% hater by proportion out there in the audience. And you can help. One fatwa a week issued against me, is that too much to ask in the 21st century? And not always from Volkswagen or Mercedes-Benz or Holden or Ford. Let's mix it up a little, shall we? And then I guess on the other level, I'm reminded of a great truism my grandpappy used to tell me up on Walton Mountain. I don't know why he continued to take me up there. I always found it backward and I hated it. Anyway, he used to say, John boy, if you can't do anything worthwhile with your life, you might as well Mind fuck people. For more on mind fucking, get Mind Fucking by Colin McGinn. An excellent read, I might add. He's professor of philosophy at the University of Miami. A bit of a hard slog intellectually, but well worth it. And trust me on this, don't go out too hard or too early. Get yourself a warm up, okay? And I'd suggest this on truth and on Bullshit, both by Professor Harry G. Frankfurt. He is Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Princeton. So, those philosophers, those evil genius philosophers, I would not trust them as far as I could throw them, frankly. They spend their lives in a dark room searching for a black cat that is not there, and it messes with your head, right? It's almost as bad as the religious who do that in the dark room looking for the black cat that's not there, only they choose to shout out from time to time, I found it, yes, salient difference there. Okay, three fantastic books I'd suggest just right for the evil genius in your life.